I will uh, now turn it over to our uh, senator from Kansas, Jerry Moran. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the uh, honor of being with you here today. Um, first of all, let me start out by saying that I'm not a veteran. Uh, I would add to that fact that I graduated from high school in 1972, which may suggest to you the time frame in which I grew up. Uh, I was a part of a class that got a, a, a lottery number, uh, and by the time it was for anybody in, in my graduating class to be called to service in Vietnam, uh, the war was Vietnamized, and uh, none of my high school classmates uh, were at least drafted into Vietnam or uh, although a few became uh, veterans, became members of the military and ultimately veterans. I thought we learned a couple things. I should, let me, let me explain, explain that just a little bit more. Um, so I grew up watching Vietnam on the nightly news almost every night of my high school years. And I, what I took from that was a couple of things. One, I would say that our country should never engage in war until we have the full support of the American people, and until we have leaders who have decided we're going to pursue a strategy that results in success, and we're never going to walk away until we achieve that success. More importantly, perhaps, to you, what I took away from that experience of growing up with Vietnam in the background of my life was that we have a responsibility as American citizens to make sure that we honor those who served, and we do that certainly by uh, words and deeds, but we also do that by making certain that those who served our country receive the benefits, including health care, that they're in, entitled to, that they earned. Uh, I've been a member of the Senate only I'm in my first term. I've only been a, a senator for four years. I served in the House of Representatives prior to that. I've been a member of the Veterans Committee since I went to Congress, since Kansan sent me there. Uh, I have uh, have tried to take this, these issues of Vietnam veterans, but uh, veterans generally, uh, to heart and to pursue policies that result in better care and treatment for those who served our country. My dad was a World War II veteran, and that adds the perspective of growing up in a household with a father who served our country and who took great uh, care and concern for the nation that he wanted to leave behind. I think it's our responsibility as American citizens to make sure that we do the things in our lives that uh, leave our country to the next generation with the freedoms and liberties guaranteed by our Constitution and the ability for every American to pursue the American dream. I recognize that my family and I have the ability to do the things that we do today in pursuit of the American dream and with the liberties and freedoms that we enjoy as Americans as a result of the sacrifice and service of you and many others who served our country. I want to do the things as a public official, as a member now of the United States Senate, but most importantly as a citizen of this country that honors and esteems the service that you have provided in your service to Vietnam, to your service in Vietnam. Because of the efforts of many at this table and people in this room, uh, we have been an advocate for the Department of Veterans Affairs expanding the benefits and health care that they provide to veterans uh, for circumstances that sometimes haven't been able to be proved scientifically, medically. What I've always told the VA from day one and my colleagues in Congress that we ought to always, quote, err on the side of including people who went to serve their country and were healthy and came home and were not healthy or after being here for a while back from service to their country became unhealthy and yet there's not quite the science or medicine to prove what the cause and effect is. We ought not be legalistic about this. We ought to be caring and compassionate, and we ought to be able to infer that people who were healthy before their service and who are no longer healthy, that there is a consequence to their military service, and the Department of Veterans Affairs ought to recognize those conditions and afflictions. We've made some progress, but we're certainly short of all the progress that needs to be made. And now the issue of the next generation is presented. And this is where we want to now focus significant attention. And I think the reason that um, I'm invited to be with you today is legislation that uh, we've introduced with Senator Blumenthal 
I'm a Republican from Kansas. Senator Blumenthal is a Democrat from Connecticut. And the legislation that we have introduced and will now pursue our colleagues in joining us uh, is this. It's called the Toxic Exposure Act. And it deals specifically with Agent Orange, but also with the burn pits and other experiences that our uh, military men and women have experienced and are experiencing as a result of their service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this legislation says that we're going to require the Department of Veterans Affairs to create a center for research and study of the consequences of Agent Orange, including the consequences of exposure to toxic substances on the next generation, on children, grandchildren, and future generations beyond that. Um, I have, and, and if this legislation passes, and with your help, I think we can be successful, uh, if this legislation passes, the VA would then begin a center at one of the VA facilities in our country in which the devotion is to finding the cause and effect, to demonstrate the relationship not only to the military service man or woman, but also to his or her children and grandchildren, and then direct the Department of Veterans Affairs to provide health care services to someone who in this case may turn out not to be a veteran. That would be a relatively new experience when it comes to health care within the Department of Veterans Affairs is can we care for our children and grandchildren uh, who, as we heard, through no fault of their own, now suffer from medical and uh, uh, emotional, medical and uh, mental conditions as a result of exposure to toxic substances. It also creates a national campaign to educate uh, Americans, as you have been trying to do for a long time. Uh, to create the opportunity to educate veterans about the potential opportunities that exist at the VA for their care and treatment, and to develop the connection with children and grandchildren. Um, this center would be designed to have children and grandchildren uh, come to the center and be part of the research and the testing and ultimately the medical care and treatment. In addition to that, it creates an advisory board that I would guess many of your leaders, Herb perhaps and others, will be a part of in advising the Department of Veterans Affairs how to create this project, this research program, and the intended result is not just more information. That apparently is necessary for, to get us where we need to go, but the intended result of this legislation is to use the information, the research that we conduct, to make certain that all those who have exposure, either directly or indirectly through their parent or grandparent or beyond, to have access to the Department of Veterans Affairs health care programs. Now, I uh, have been a critic recently of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I think they have failed in their mission, and I'm reluctant to expand their scope of activity when they don't seem to do well many of the things that we already asked them to do for veterans today. But I'm of the view that this issue is so important, I am convinced by Larry and others, Kansas veterans who have been to see me about the significance of this issue. And we want to demonstrate um, our care and compassion for those who are children and grandchildren of veterans. And once again, to go back to what I said in the beginning of my remarks, honor those who served our country in Vietnam and since. And so the Toxic Exposure Act is what I hope that the VVA will, will become front and center legislation for them. They will work with me and Senator Blumenthal. I would ask you all to go home to your senators, to your House members, and ask them to engage in an issue that I think can make a difference. Let me conclude by saying that the, the Department of Veterans Affairs, I've been a, a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee now for 18 years, 14 years in the House, four years in the Senate. Um, I, was, I asked for the previous secretary's resignation. I've never asked for any cabinet secretary to resign in the time I've been a member of Congress. And I've known that there are huge challenges and significant problems at the VA for a long time, but what seemed to have happened to me over the last several years is the problems became so consuming that the, v, that the VA, in many instances, determined that they were just had no ability, ultimately had no desire sufficient desire anyway to solve problems. I have now met with the new secretary. I voted for his confirmation. We have sat down to talk about this issue. Uh, I asked and he gave me his cell phone number. Uh, that is a different experience than what I've had over the last several years in trying to get anybody at the VA's attention 
to the issues that Kansas veterans raise with me. So in my view, we have this issue of toxic exposure, but we also have the broader issue is, are we going to have a Department of Veterans Affairs that lives up to its mandate to care for those who served our country? In my view, who are the people in our country who deserve the absolute best care and treatment? If it's not our military men and women and our veterans, I don't know who it would be. And yet we have had developed an attitude over time in many instances, the VA, of a shrug of shoulders, there's nothing we can do. And we're going to prove that that culture can be overcome and that veterans, once again, will have the, the uh, priority that they deserve in our nation. Uh, We have had some success in the passage of the most recent piece of legislation in which we are telling veterans, we're telling, actually we're telling the Department of Veterans Affairs, if you're not going to provide the services that are necessary within a, the amount of time that's medically required, or if you're a veteran who lives a long distance from a VA facility, that you're going to have the card to allow you the opportunities to find health care services at home or a place of your choice. I think that's in the right a move in the right direction. It comes from being a Kansan. The congressional district that I represented for 14 years is larger than the state of Illinois, and there is no VA hospital in the congressional district. How does a veteran get from a place in Kansas to Wichita to access service? And so something that we've been promoting is now coming to fruition. More importantly, we're going to make certain that we pay a lot of attention to what goes on at the VA in hopes that the new leadership has a different culture the bureaucracy is different than what we've had before, and the people who work at the VA have the opportunity to care for the veterans. Many of them themselves are veterans, and we've created a system in which those who want to do good things end up in a bureaucratic mess that doesn't reward good behavior and, in fact, encourages bad behavior. And so I'm hoping, desiring, and working hard to try to make certain that the service and sacrifice that you uh, provided to our country is honored today, it's honored tomorrow, and the new addition to that mandate is that we take care of the children, the grandchildren, those who follow us, whose parent or grandparent served in our military, and they are suffering the consequences as a result of nothing they did, but something that results from the, the honorable actions of those who preceded them. This is a honor for me to be here. Uh, I have great regard for those who served our country. There is no group of people that I hold in higher regard than our veterans, with one exception, and that is veterans who help other veterans. And I honor all of you here today for being those kind of people. When I get discouraged about Washington, D.C., and I pointed out that Senator Blumenthal, a Democrat, and I, a Republican, come together on this issue, this kind of thing doesn't happen often enough. And I spoke about this on the Senate floor not too long ago in which I was worried that this legislation that just passed and was signed into law by the President earlier this week was not, going to be, was not going to happen because we're going to break down over Republican and Democrat lines. When I get discouraged about the place that I go to work every week, I'll put on my running shoes. I won't run, but I'll walk to the Lincoln Memorial. And on that walk, I will go now by the World War II Memorial. Incidentally, the World War II Memorial, right before it opened, I went up to see what it was going to look like. Uh, I had my cell phone with me. I stepped away from the memorial. This is just a few days before it was dedicated, about 10 years ago. And uh, I used my cell phone to call my dad at home in Plainville, Kansas. Uh, my dad would have been about 92. He just died last month at age 98. And I called my dad at home and I said, uh, fortunately for me, I got the answering machine. Because it's difficult sometimes to say the things that you want to tell your parents. So I got my dad on the, got his answering machine. I said, Dad, I'm at the World War II Memorial, built in your honor. I want you to know that I respect you, I thank you for your service, and I love you. And it's the message that, in my view, it's my responsibility, in fact, every American's responsibility to deliver. I tell you this story because it's an, it, that part is true. I believe we have that responsibility. But to show you how my dad were, operates, a few minutes later, my cell phone rings, and he says, Gerald? Um, I got your message, but I couldn't hear it. Could you tell me again? <laughs> uh, 
But on that walk, I'll go by the World War II Memorial. I next go by the Vietnam Wall. And on my way back, I come by the Korean War Memorial. And in each of those three settings, I am reminded of this fact. No one memorialized in those three settings, World War II, Vietnam, or Korean War, did they volunteer, were they drafted for purposes of taking care of Republicans or taking care of Democrats? They served their country because they believed it was useful to the future for their family members, and they believed that America was a special place that was deserving of that service to try to preserve the freedoms and liberties that we enjoy as American citizens. Not one of them said, I'm going to fight for Republicans or I'm going to fight for Democrats. And it reminds me, and I've told my colleagues this time and time again, that we need to role model after those people who are honored in those three settings as compared to the silliness of Washington, D.C., in which it's Republicans versus Democrats and Democrats versus Republicans. There is a much higher calling to what we do, as evidenced by you as servicemen and women and now veterans. And you are the role models that members of Congress should follow. I hope we learn from you, and I hope our approach to governing in Washington, D.C. is something different than it is today. Thank you very much for your service to our country.